Welcome to the course. Today is our last installment of our 52-week series in the book of John. And on Easter, which I'm looking forward to, of course, next week, we're gonna, I'm going to try to just wrap up the entire book with one message. All right? It's taken me a year to get through the whole thing, and now I'm going to try to do one message to wrap it up. And so that's going to be our focus next week, and we're going to have baptism next week. It's going to be a powerful, yeah, you can clap for that. Yeah, that's great. It'll be a, I, I trust it'll be a powerful service next week and, of course, the Easter breakfast and all that. And so I just want to let us know where I am going or where we are going next. Whether you like it or not, you're going to come with me, okay? Um, so for eight weeks, we're going to go to the Old Testament. And by the way, it is intentional that I'll do New Testament and then we'll do Old Testament we might do biographical, we might do a little topical, we'll look at different things. It's good for us to have a, a well-balanced spiritual diet, I'll just put it that way. And so a lot of you perhaps are familiar with the New Testament, and I'm sure as all of you are reading through your Bible, let's go, let's go, let's go, okay, you'll come across things. So we're going to go through the book of Habakkuk, and you'd be like, Habakkuk, what? Yeah, okay. Habakkuk. You say, what is this? Well, here's the good news. You have two weeks to go and read all three chapters, okay? It is three chapters, and it deals with some significant issues. The subtext or the title is going to be, How Long, O Lord?, he opens his lament, his questioning, as he looks around and sees all types of horrendous things happening, and he's crying out to God. And so we're going to go through that book, and my hope is that you will, number one, get language to, to voice your long-term prayers about perhaps a long-term sickness that you've been praying for for decades and decades, or someone that you love who hasn't turned to Christ, or a prodigal. These things that we carry in our heart and we continue to cry out to God, and we're still waiting for a response, or we're looking to how to continue in faith in the midst of pain or hardship or suffering or difficulty. By the way, the book of Psalms, which is 150 psalms, is incredible. It is a prayer book. It is a song book. And if you read them, by the way, over half of those psalms are called lament psalms. It is the psalmist, be it David or someone else, as they are walking in faith, often they start praising God and looking towards him, and then there is this language of, God, it's really tough right now. God, will you help me? Will you deliver me? God, I'm looking around as difficult. God, will you intervene? Will you help? Will you hurry to my rescue? And then the psalmist returns again. I am focusing again on you. The psalms help us with this language. And Habakkuk helps us to work through difficulties that we just continue in. So again, the hope is for these eight weeks with this focus that God would speak to us. And we're looking for some testimonies of people who say, yeah, that's me. I have been praying for X amount of years. And yeah, that's me where I continue to cry out to the Lord. And my hope is, and I imagine the Lord will do this among us, that we will strengthen our faith, give us courage, give us focus, give us understanding, give us language that we can cry out, how long, O Lord? So that is our next series. And by the way, here's a super heads up, a very early bird in the summer. Then we're going to shift to a epistle. We're going to go to the book of Philippians, probably is the most <laughs> quoted book of the Bible. There's lots of really good quotable things in there. And we're going to work through that over this summer as we look to so many things that Paul helps us with when it comes to our faith as we look to it as Scripture. So that's where we're going upcoming, and now you know.
okay? So again, I feel like I'm saying goodbye to a, a good friend today as we're going to conclude again the book of John. It has been a remarkable time to again look for and see Jesus in all his glory. If you have been with us over this past year or so, my hope is that you treasure him more, you honor him greater, that you fall deeper in love with him, that your faith has been and continue to be equipped and strengthened and encouraged knowing that what we believe is based on things that happen with a person named Jesus Christ. My hope is that you have grabbed on to the promises, and again, you've seen him in greater glory. Last week, and as we are in this final chapter, chapter 21, if you have a Bible, go ahead, open to it. Chapter 21, we're going to start in verse 17. We're right in the middle of this epilogue, this uh, final uh, post-credit scene, so to speak, where Jesus is primarily interacting with Peter and is restoring the guys, and then today we'll see him commissioning not just Peter, but all of us. And it's a fantastic ending where Jesus says, follow me. And he says again, you must follow me. And we're going to look at this. Now, last week I gave an invitation for those who say, hey, this message, of course, last week of the restoration of Peter was for all of us. And it was specifically for some people that said, this is me. And I gave an invitation to prayer. A number of people came up. Will you pray and will you pray? There's one guy in particular that if the message wasn't for anybody, it was for him. And he shared to me, uh, shared with me part of his story. And I know Don for a long time. Come on up, Don. And I said, Don, will you share with us uh, a portion of your story and what perhaps happened um, last week? And so why don't we give a Welcome to Mr. Don Reed. <laughs> and keep, keep it close up. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. So last Sunday, um, I heard a message, 2117 out of John. It's just unbelievable because what God's doing in my life is, is crazy. So when he told, talked about feed my sheep, I'm from Myrtle Beach. I'm up here just visiting with my sister. and So I walk the beach a lot. And I'm walking the beach one day, and uh, my head's up in the clouds and I kind of looked out on the, the ocean, and uh, I saw a guy. There's not many people walking, but I saw a guy up there six, 700 yards up, and I wasn't paying any attention. And I saw him bend down. Lots of people do that at the beach. They're always picking up uh, shells and all that. So I paid no attention. So as I'm shuffling along, looking up, and, and talking to God, and saying, thanks, I can't believe what you're doing. How, how I ended up at Myrtle Beach is a miracle, a story to itself. But I was pretty convinced that God could not use me. I'm... I've blown it, uh, had myself convinced I'm a loser, abandoned this, abandoned that. I've been to prison. I mean, there's no way that God could possibly use me. So anyway, I get up to where this guy had been bent down, and I never looked up, but I happened to look down, and there in the sand is written, feed my sheep. Exactly what's in this book. I said, what? So I, you know, I was freaking out, and as I stood there, a wave came and took that out. So I, before I did, I took my phone out and I took a couple pictures because I nobody's going to believe that. I wasn't far from my church, so I scooted over there looking for my pastor, and he wasn't in, but I grabbed a youth guy, and I said, look at this, look at this. I, I kind of intimidated him because, uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm just that way with him. But uh, anyway, he said, well, like, what do you want me to do with it? I, yeah, nothing. He didn't get it. I got it. So at any rate, God started talking to me, and he said, look, pay attention, listen, look. And I did. He started putting people in my life, and all of a sudden, it started to make sense. I had to engage a little bit. I had to start believing that I wasn't worthless, that my sins were not unforgivable, and that there could be a purpose in my life. Whatever it was, I didn't know, but I said, okay, this ain't getting it, because this tape I'm playing through, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm not, I, I just mentally can't do it. I'm, I, I don't know what to do. I, I'm hopeless. So he had started to engage me, and, and it's just amazing. And, and he's given me a little thing to do. I, I invite people to church. I have a real s small, short message. I'm getting older. I'm going to see God pretty soon. And some of these people that I work with are, are disadvantaged, and they're kind of hopeless. And I'll say, do you know Jesus? 
well, why not? And uh, I'll give them a little, a little quick story about, you know what, Jesus cares for your soul. Does anybody else? He cares about your eternity. Does anybody else? And I say, if you are, let's, 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 let's talk about going to church, and I'll make a, a deal, and I'll pick them up on Sundays. And it's, it's turning out to be something, but I, it's just something I never thought I could do. So all that to say, God is great. God is worth hoping for, and thanks. By the way, this guy's great, his wife is great, too. So thank you. I think I uh, met Don probably 10 or so years ago as uh, he was here dealing with some of, some of the, the demons in his life, I'll just put it that way, and became friends. He participated in the church, God called him away, and he's back here to minister to his sister and family, and you know, he's like, man, he told that story, and then to have that, I said, Don, you're probably here. He's just been here for a few months, and he'll go back at some point. Um, I said, if it's for anybody, that message is for you. And we had a good time of prayer, with tears in his eyes, and the Lord is continuing to call people to himself, and we can say amen to that. <laughs> aren't you grateful for a merciful Savior? Aren't you grateful for a gracious God? Aren't you grateful for the invitation we have to walk alongside him? And so again, this morning, we are looking at the last bit of this gospel of John. And so I'm going to pick up the story in verse 18, as we saw, again, Peter and Jesus interacting, right? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Take care of my lambs. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter then was restored because of his failing and falling that he had taken place. God brought him back to the place of his pain to heal him, to restore him, to commission him, and to send him forward as Jesus was anticipating to ascend to the Father uh, at some point in the future. Now, when Jesus was done with this conversation with Peter and the guys were there around that fire, they had gotten up and were walking along the seashore. And Jesus then tells Peter some significant news about his life and how following Jesus would impact him. So this is what we have, John 21, starting with verse 18. Jesus said, very truly... I tell you, Peter, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Now, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is the first thing I want us to focus on from this section this morning. Follow Jesus at any cost. Now, our hope is that as we grow older, we will grow in more comfort or have more freedom to do what we may want to be. Perhaps we'll retire and have a nice retirement benefits and we'll have the freedom and the free time and the finances to kind of do what we want to do, go where we want to go, eat what we want to eat, get up at the glorious hour of the crack of noon. Right? <laughs> we kind of think that way a little bit, right? Oh, that's the way it should be, right? <laughs> and <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> and Jesus, now with this mm, call, not just to Peter but to all of us to follow him, saying, hey, Peter, 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 I want you to know that as you follow me, of course, there is going to be glorious things. However, the end of your story, you're going to go to a place that you're not going to 
want to go. By the way, the expression of that your arms would be stretched out is an expression of Peter. You're going to die being crucified. Now, indeed, this did happen. Peter, as historians tell us, was crucified. And the story goes that he did not feel even worthy enough to be crucified as Jesus was, but they turned him upside down under the reign of Nero, around 60 or so in that range. Jesus was telling Peter at this point, he had a lot of ministry yet to do, at least 20 if not 30 more years of ministry, saying, Peter, follow me. And as you follow me, everything will not be easy. Everything will not go as you desire. But Peter, I'm telling you, continue to follow me because In dying and living in this way, you will glorify me in your death. It is a downright travesty that this statement, this concept, that in following Jesus you will face hardship, flies in the face of often modern Western philosophy and theology, right? People think that, well, if you follow Jesus, if you get close to Him, somehow God owes you your best life now. It is a false teaching, and I'll be so bold to say, some of it is demonically inspired. And we here in our Western American affluent culture gravitate that to that. And we say, oh, that's very appealing to me. That means I can get, come to Jesus. So Jesus is kind of a get um, healthy, get wealthy scheme. And so if I pray a prayer and to attend church and give money and give more money and give more money and give more money, right? That everything will go well with me because God owes it to me. This quote-unquote gospel gets exported from primarily America to other countries in the world. Thank you, Jim Black. Africa, I've been there. Asian companies, countries have been there, India, I've been there, that they are not coming to Jesus as an end, but people are coming to Jesus as a means to an end. They don't necessarily want Jesus, right? They want what they think Jesus can get them. Mo money, right? So instead of Jesus being the sovereign Lord, who we treasure more than anything else, we see Jesus as The holy bank account God, right? That he now has to do what I want him to do. And if he doesn't, then I'm going to go find a different quote-unquote God. We make even Jesus an idol. How do you like that? Not seeing him as a sovereign Lord, not seeing him as a Savior, not seeing him as he came to save his people from their sin. Right? Do you hear me? It's a perversion of the gospel, and we export it, and people gravitate on it, and you can turn on the Christian, the Christian broadcasting network and be blessed. Oh, God, thank you. I believe in checks coming. Is this what Peter heard from Jesus? It's, it's not? Do you treasure Jesus even more than your own comfort? Do you honor Jesus above all things and will follow him anywhere? Have you ever read the book of Hebrews chapter 11, right? The great faith chapter. Go through there and tell me how many of those people had it made in the shade, right? Besides perhaps Enoch, right, who walked with God for a while and they went upstairs for a bit, right? 
difficulties happen. Jesus says that in this life you will have health, wealth, and prosperity. Did he say that? In this life you will have trouble. He says, hey, but I've overcome the world. The Bible talks about that we'll have trials of various kinds. Thank you, James. That indeed there will be hardships and there will be persecutions and there will be calamities. And Jesus said that people will hate you. Not because you're a horrible person, but because you love Jesus. Do you understand? This is in the Bible. Right? Just because you believe in Jesus does not exempt you from difficulty. And the truth is that at times it is because you have faith in Jesus, because of your faith in Jesus, that will bring on some difficulties and hardships and sufferings. I have tons of scripture passages in here to back this up so you know I'm not lying to you. (laughs) We have redefined how God defines what being blessed is. Do you remember the Sermon on the Mount? Do you remember the B attitudes? Bless it. Is the pure in heart, for say will, they will see God. Blessed are those of you who hunger and, and thirst for righteousness, for you will be filled. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and what? Be glad. For why? Your reward is great in heaven's for so they have persecuted the prophets who were before you. This, by the way, is true blessing. This, by the way, is true reward. This, by the way, the, the um, inheritance that you and I are to receive, those who love Christ, are kept in heaven for us. Right? We are promised this abundance inheritance, and we are promised that God will be with us, and we're promised that God will help us and strengthen us and encourage us, and we're promised that the the Spirit will help us to persevere and endure. Do you understand this promise? So I don't want you to be surprised that if you're a Christian, if you've been a Christian for a long time, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? But if you somehow believed that Christianity is a get-rich scheme, you've been sold a bag of goods. Right? You, indeed, will have a glorious inheritance of the saints. That day is coming, but now we follow Jesus to all places, no matter what the cost, because we love Him. Right? It breaks my heart to hear stories of people who have, quote-unquote, fallen away from the faith because Jesus didn't do for them what they thought Jesus should do for them, and they got mad. They haven't even come to the true gospel to know what Jesus is and what he truly offers us. What he promises us is eternal life. What he promises us is the Holy Spirit to make us new. What he promises us is to prepare a place for us. What he promises us that it will be worth it in the end and throughout. This is faith that lasts. And hey, Peter, in following me, you will proclaim me. 
Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost. This great denier stood up in front of thousands and proclaimed this Christ, this risen Lord, the one who they said, Hosanna, and the one they said, crucify, rose from the dead, and he proclaimed the message. Peter was strong in the faith. And by the way, Peter wasn't always, always strong. Peter had a little issue. If you notice that Jesus was addressing it, his issue was being afraid of people. You think, Peter? What? This bold, quick to action dude? Yeah. Well, I don't know about, I don't want you to treat me poorly. I don't want you to think you, uh, that I'm associated with Jesus. I'm kind of scared of your opinion of me, Peter, right? This, by the way, resurfaces another time. Book of Galatians, I think it's chapter 2, chapter 3, talks about <laughs> Peter and Paul, and they had a little confrontation because Peter was, you know, hey, I can eat with anybody, and it's okay, and then some Jewish people came, it's like, oh, they might not like me, so I'm just going to hang out with the Jewish, Peter, the Jewish people, and Paul was like, Peter, what are you doing? Right? Why do I bring this up? <laughs> I bring this up is... Our love of God sustains us and helps us, but doesn't necessarily always take away our pain places and some of our internal sin issues, right? Wouldn't that be great if you became a Christian and you never sinned again? Right? Oh, I hope that's the number one thing you long for after seeing Jesus when you get to heaven, that the sin nature will be no more. We fight these things, we grow in these things, we renew our minds in these things, we choose to either follow the Spirit or follow the flesh, but we follow Jesus regardless of hell or high water, we're following Him, because He is worth it. Who else can we turn to? Right? Who else is like Him? Who else gave His life for me? Who else can forgive me? Who else as the words of life. Be like Joshua and his final speech. He said, hey, 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 as for me and my house, we are serving the Lord. Right? I desire and God desires that our faith will stand regardless of the circumstances, regardless if our family is for us or against us, regardless if our occupational place is for Jesus or against Jesus, regardless if we have pain or suffering or sorrow, we will follow Jesus at all costs. Peter, follow me. I know what's going to happen. You follow me. I know what's going to happen. It's going to be Okay, this is the message, right? This is the message. Peter, your death is the way that will glorify me the most. I want us in our decision making. Right now, we have decisions to make. From the mundane things of what to eat for lunch to bigger questions of where to serve or who to marry or what job to take or whatever. We all have decisions. In your decision-making process, I want you to put in as a high point, I want you to ask yourself this question. What decision is going to best glorify God? Do you think that way when you're making decisions? Of course you do. You're like, oh, of course I do. <laughs> what we usually think is, mm, what's going to be easier? What am I going to like the most? What's going to be the most convenient for me? Right? <laughs> no, those are factors, but they should not be the factor. How would your and my decisions be affected if our number one decision-making criterion is what will glorify God the most. That's the right decision. Right? Now, we have to discern that, right? You think Jim Black loved traveling coach for 24 hours? 
Jim Black could be sitting back. Jack, see what I did? I just rhymed there, right? <laughs> you think that's fun? I've been on trips with him. Jim's fun. The airplane is not. <laughs> <laughs> and eating chicken that will take all of the hair off of everywhere. It's not fun. Bug bites and sicknesses and illnesses. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. It'd be a lot easier if you just stayed here. Your wife's a great cook. And she's pretty, right? And you got your own bed and your own car. Why did Jim Black do that? Jim Black is not making his decision. I didn't know I was going to talk about you, but here you are. Your, your illustration. <laughs> Jim Black does this because he's determined that I'd rather live my life in difficulty for the glory of God and live my life in comfort for my own glory. Right? Respect people that make these decisions. I want you to think about this. If, any, if you remember anything from today, <laughs> okay, in this decision, what will most glorify God? You'll start making decisions that are ultimately lined with the will of God. God will meet you in it. God will bless you through it. Doesn't mean that, oh, everything's going to be easy. It probably won't be. Do it anyway. So John, by the Holy Spirit, after revealing Christ to us chapter after chapter and verse after verse and incident and teaching after incident and teaching, then comes down and says, hey, 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 follow me. I know what's going to happen. I've ordained it to happen, even pain and some suffering and some difficulty, but know that this will bless me and most glorify me, and also know, hey, by the way, it's temporary. <laughs> Eternity, if you've done the math, is a lot longer than your life. The light and momentary troubles. Bro, I've been sick for 40 years. Your light and momentary trouble. Bro, I've been struggling with this for 50 years. Your light and momentary trouble. Trouble in comparison to eternity. Understand these things. Follow Jesus at any cost. So Peter heard this message from Jesus after he was restored. Okay, Peter, now let's get to work. Let's get busy. This is what's going to happen. Hey, follow me. Now Peter at this point, right, heard about what's going to happen to his life. It's like, mm. and he kind of looked around. He says, hmm, well, what about him, Jesus? What's going to happen to him, right? Well, let's read this interaction, verse 20 in John 21. So Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This, by the way, was John. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray him? This is John. Now, when Peter saw him, he asked, Hey, Lord, what about him? <laughs> now, Jesus answered, <clears throat> Peter, <laughs> if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? <laughs> Ooh. Peter, stop looking around. Look at me, Peter. You must follow me. Now, because of this statement, a rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. This is what John was dealing with. People would come up to John, Hey, John, I heard you're not going to die. John's like, dude, what are you talking about? Right? He's just clarifying it here. He says, hey, I'm going to let you know, Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Okay. So what's the takeaway for us 
This is what I'm asking us to focus on. Follow Jesus. How? Focused on Him. Focused on Him. Now, there's a couple things, well, actually a bunch of things, but a couple things that I want us to think about from this correspondence between Jesus and Peter when it came to the lives of other people. Number one, Jesus is sovereign over your life. Okay? Peter, if I want him to live forever, that's my prerogative, not yours, Peter. I can do with your life as I see fit, and I can do with his life as I see fit. I tailor a plan for every life, including every person in this room right now. God has a plan for your life. You can trust him and rest in it. Now, does that mean that everything will go perfect? No. Does that mean you won't be in the hospital and away from church for a long time? Welcome back, by the way. Heisner, it's good to see you. He has a plan for you. So number one, God is sovereign over our lives, right? And second, by the way, Jesus says, hey, until I return. If I want him to remain alive, until I return. This is another promise of Christ, by the way. The one who keeps his promises. You say, amen to that, right? I want, if you can, put on the treasure chest of your heart the reality and the promise that Jesus is going to return again, right? This isn't some, you know, fanciful preaching point to get people to stay and follow Jesus. This is what Jesus said multiple times over and over again. I'm coming again. I'm coming back soon. I'm going to be here again. This is going to happen. Let that resonate with your soul, right? There is an eternity. You have never met a mere mortal. Because of the resurrection, we'll have new life, and you are going to live forever. This matters, and it takes faith. Faith in what? Jesus and His promises. And you may have a wonderful grandmother, and you believe her, but she ain't good as Jesus If you're going to believe anyone, behold the Lamb. Listen to Him. If we understood this, it would help us with our decision making, right? One day I'm going to be in the eternal kingdom. One day I'm going to stand in front of Christ. I am going to live forever. What matters most is what is eternal. So therefore, all of this stuff and all of my time and all my energies and all my efforts, I'm going to give it away to grab hold of what matters most. Does that make sense? This is a faith that moves. And I'm not talking a blind faith. John didn't say, well, just believe me. He says, no, 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 let me give you evidence and let me give you um, things to think about. And let me tell you more about Jesus and let me show you what I've experienced and believe in his word. Jesus says, hey, I am going to come back again. Right? He is sovereign for each one of us. Right? So get busy what he's asked you to do. Have you ever compared your life to somebody else's life? I surely have. Right? Comparing your life to the lives of others leads nowhere good. It's a dead end. What will happen is that if you see people that have it worse than you, right, it leads to pride. Yep, they got that because they suck and I'm better than them. You probably don't use that word. I'm sorry. Some of you might be like, don't use that word. They're horrible, okay? Right? And it's like, well, I'm better than them because I'm smarter, better looking, and I have whiter teeth, right? Or whatever it is, right? What it leads is to um, pride often, right? I'm better. 
Now, if you look at people that are beyond you, what does that lead to? Self-pity, envy, jealousy. Both of the comparison pits are not a good place for you to be because you will get bogged down in either place. Love, by the way, does not compare. Celebrates, weeps, rejoices, suffers. Love doesn't compare, right? I've compared people. Back when I was a young, um, a young dude, who was 21 years old, we're newly married. It was myself, and there was another young guy, right, who was graduating the same time, right, went to a different school, same education, wanted to go into ministry. We're both interning at the church, right? We actually looked the same. People got our names mixed up, right? <laughs> they still do get our names mixed up, which is kind of crazy, right? And so this little dinky church in Minneapolis that we had set up things in a trailer and take it down, and we had, you know, just, just not, you know, we're, we're trying, right? And so I got hired on for like, I don't know, five hours a week or ten hours a week, right? And my friend, right, he got hired down in this big old church, right? To be their youth pastor, full-time, big congregation, you know. And I was looking over him, and I'm looking at me, I'm like, dude, he ain't any smarter than I am. I'm definitely better looking. <laughs> I didn't say that. Like, what? We had to, like, really sit. It's like my twin. I'm like, what? And I was complaining. I'm like, man, I am struggling, right? I'm working three or four jobs. I got a wonderful wife, a child on the way. And that would have been really great. Why God, him? Why not me? Right? The Lord, by the way, in his kindness, and you rebuked me. <laughs> hey, Dave, what is that to you, what I do with this life? His calling and his path is different than your calling and your path. Follow me. I'm grateful for that struggle. <laughs> I'm grateful for setting up church in a trailer. By the way, it comes in later in my story. I'm grateful for having to just grind and to learn. It, it made me who I am to do what I can do now. And today will help us and your story will help the rest of your story. You understand, but comparison doesn't help. I've been jealous of people, and I've learned, Dave, that does not lead anywhere good in your soul. It doesn't help. Follow me. Jesus will not judge us according to our superiority or inferiority over anybody. He will judge us against what he has called us to do. <laughs> you measure the right thing, right? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, You are... God's workmanship, masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he's ordained or created or predestined you to do. So do what God's called you to do. Well, I wish I could sing. Do what God's called you to do. Well, I wish I could preach. Do what God's called you to do. Well, I wish I could do this or I could do this or I could do this. Do what God's called you to do. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Ask of God, what do you want me to do? God's not going to say, hmm, I don't know. I don't have nothing for you. Sorry. He's not going to say that. If you teach, teach. If you pick up trash around here, pick it up for the glory of God. If you program computers or paint walls or clean out chimneys, or build cars, or fly airplanes, send stuff to Africa, do it for the glory of God. It matters. Do it. He's not going to measure my life with Jim's life and say, well, Dave, you didn't go to Africa as much as Jim did. <laughs> He's not going to say that. He's going to say, hey, bro, what did you do with what I asked you to do? I was too busy looking, looking over at Jim over there. <laughs> Come on, are you hearing me here? Come on, hear me. Hear me. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. Don't bemoan your lot in life. Thank God for what he's given and do it. Do 
quit. Do it. I beg you, do it. Follow Jesus by focusing your eyes on him. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author who's writing your story and the perfecter of your faith. Fix your eyes on him. Love him, adore him, honor him, cherish him. You must follow him because you trust him. Do this. Now the book ends this way, right? So we hear this interaction with Peter and we listen and we absorb these things ourselves. We must follow him regardless of where he leads and must follow him by focusing in on him doing what he's asked me to do. In verse 24, then John concludes with this. He identifies himself and says, hey, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and wrote them down. It's like, hey, it's me. I wrote these down. We, mu- we know that his testimony is true. I'm telling you the truth. Trust me. Verse 25. Now, Jesus did many other things as well. <laughs> I wish I knew those things. Maybe someday. Now, if every one of them are written down, I suppose the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written Last thing I want us to focus on is follow Jesus in his ever-expanding story. By the grace of God, God led John to edit and to bring forward certain events. And he said, hey, I wrote them all down. There's no way. And here's... The good news, the story of Jesus is not over yet. Send his Holy Spirit, you know why? (laughs) When Jesus was in the body, he could be one place at one time. His Holy Spirit can be everywhere at once, working and changing us and empowering us and healing us and transforming us and encouraging us and leading us everywhere all at once. It's his story and he's continuing to work, right? Have you seen Jesus work in your life? Time and time again. His story is not concluded at this book and in the ascension. It continues and it's ever expanding. Jesus shows up in a lot of places. People in Asia who have not heard about Jesus, Jesus calls them in a dream and says, hey, go and go to this church and talk to this person. Jesus helps us and encourages us and provides for us and strengthens us and disciplines us and loves us. We are to tell about what we have seen and known of Jesus. Just as John said, these things are true. When I ask you to pray this way, God, will you give me an opportunity to tell people about Jesus? Jesus and his work in my life. Will you pray for that way? Well, I don't know enough. You sat here for a year and heard about the gospel. When people in the book of Acts get saved and baptized, they don't say, well, just keep it to yourself for a while until you go to seminary. <laughs> Fooey. Hey, let me tell you what Jesus did in my life. Can you do that? Hey, let me tell you what Jesus is doing in my life. Pray for this. Tell the story. Hey, I want to let you know I prayed for this last week, and this is people that aren't even Christians. I prayed for this, and look what happened. I am praying for this, and I'm still waiting to hear. I'm praying for this, but Jesus didn't completely heal me, and it's getting worse, but I still trust in him. Do you hear me? Habakkuk. 
Share the story. See the story. See Christ. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's go, John. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. This is Jesus. Do you love him? Will you follow him? Will you dedicate and rededicate and follow him regardless? He's the light of the world. These things were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you may have life in His name. The name above all names. This is Jesus. Jesus, thank you for moving among us in this place. Jesus, thank you for walking through us and having space and time to look at this book. Jesus, thank you for the invitation to continue walking with you and continuing to living with you as your story continues even in our lives. We choose to follow you. Help us to follow you. Help us to see you and be fixated on you. Thank you for your companionship. Thank you for the fellowship of the church. Thank you for your help. We believe in you. Jesus, you are the light of the world. You have the name that is above all names. We recognize that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. That you are Lord to the glory of the Father. God, I'm asking you that we would see you clearly and we'll see you profoundly and we will love you more. Thank you for your work among us. Thank you for what you've done with us. Thank you for what you promise to us. May you be praised in all time and through all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.